So good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the official kickoff of the National World War II Museum's 16th International Conference on World War II. It is really wonderful to see you all here in our Madeline and Paul Hilliard Conference Center here at the museum's very own Higgins Hotel. And it's been great tonight to see some familiar faces that go back to the very beginning of this conference and also to meet some new friends. So welcome to you all. Uh, and for those of you I haven't met yet, uh, my name is Stephen Watson, and I have the, the privilege of being the president and CEO here at the National World War II Museum. So uh, as I think you know, uh, we had a big month last month. We opened our final permanent exhibition pavilion, uh, Liberation. Uh, and in honor of that, um, today our pre-conference symposium was tied to the pavilion's themes, and I think it was really a great way to kick off, which I know is going to be one of our very best conferences yet. So let's give all of those that participated in that program today a round of applause. So the great thing about this conference is year after year after year, uh, you continue to come back. So we appreciate that. Um, the conference is again sold out this year. Um, and I really want to just say thank you to each of you for choosing to come to New Orleans, to participate in this great event. It gives us energy, it invigorates us, and it's just wonderful to see your continuing enthusiasm for the work that we do here at the museum. And I also want to thank all of you who are watching online. You know, we started the online streaming of this program six or seven years ago, and in the first couple of years, we were proud to have hundreds of viewers online. Uh, and now, uh, we are in the tens of thousands. Tens of thousands of people that are watching this. <laughs> Especially Jeremy Collins' remarks. So those tend to get the most views of the whole thing. So, uh, but um, it's become such a big and important part of the work uh, that we do. And again, I think a testament to the continuing interest uh, in our mission uh, and the story of World War II. So uh, before we get going tonight, um, and I think as you know, in keeping with our tradition, I want to open by recognizing uh, two members of the World War II generation who are here with us tonight. Uh, we are joined by a gentleman that many of you know very well, uh, that is museum uh, trustee, actually former chairman of the board, Paul Hilliard, who has attended every single one of our international conferences. So this is Paul's 16th conference, and I would guess he's also attended at least 100 other museum functions uh, over the years as well. So thank you, Paul. Thank you, Madeline, for being here. We're here in this wonderful conference center that you underwrote, uh, and it's a testament to your support and our museum that we're able to put on great conferences and symposia like what we're going to experience in the next couple of days. And for those of you that don't know Paul, Paul flew 45 missions as a radio man and a gunner in an SBD Dauntless dive bomber in the Pacific Theater. Uh, and you're going to have an opportunity to hear from him on Saturday morning when he and Dr. Rob Satino will talk about his new book, Dauntless, Paul Hilliard in World War II and a Transformed America. So we look forward to that on Saturday morning, Paul. We also have another World War II veteran who is with us, and he also celebrated a very special birthday on Monday. And that is Mr. George McAlpin, who was in the US Army from 1943 until 1945. Thank you, George. I think this is, you told me this is your fifth or sixth visit to the museum, and you've been following our progress all these years. Um, George served in the 35th Engineer Combat Battalion in Europe, including northern France, the Rhineland, Ardennes, Alsace, and the Central European Campaigns. So George, thank you for being here with us for what I understand is your 100th birthday this past Monday. Paul appreciates you being here as well, because he tells me he gets very few opportunities to speak to his elders these days. So uh, <laughs> he, he appreciates it. So 
Um, but coming to this conference was George's present for his big birthday. But George, we have one more gift for you today. We have a, a very special group of ladies that would like to sing you a very special song for your 100th birthday. So please welcome the museum's victory bells. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday from the victory bells. Happy birthday to you and many more. Happy birthday, Happy George. Birthday. conference. <laughs> Sorry. Well, there you go, George. Happy birthday. <laughs> yeah. Um, thank you, ladies, and, and thank you, George, for your service, for being here, and thank you also, Paul. And uh, if anybody else wants to bring their 100-year-old World War II veteran to the museum, we'd be happy to do the same thing that we did tonight. So, uh, um, and we'll see you next year for your 101st. So there you go. Um, I'd also like to invite any other uh, veterans or active duty members of our armed forces of any era to please stand or wave and be recognized for your service to our country. My thanks to all of you and to all of the family members of veterans and active duty members who take care of those who take care of us. So a few other folks I'd like to recognize. Um, we have several members of the museum's board of trustees who are with us this evening. Paul Hilliard, who I've already mentioned. I think Boise Bollinger may be here with us tonight. I know Mike Bylan, who has also attended all 16 of these conferences, is here. Uh, and Will Osborne. So thank you to our trustees for all you do to lead our museum and for participating this week. And also some of our former trustees, you know, in the last month as we opened liberation and celebrated the completion of our capital campaign, it was a reminder that we are where we are today, not just because of the people who are actively serving the museum at this point, but those who came before us. And uh, I want to recognize Deborah Lindsay, Bob Hayes, for your service on the board. Thank you both for being here as uh, trustees in the past. Uh, and also Ann Abbott, whose late husband, Herschel, uh, served on the board for many years, uh, also was a former chairman during a formative time in the museum's development. Thank you for your continued involvement and support in our mission. Thank you, Bob. So a few other folks I'd um, like to thank, and uh, I joked a little bit at the beginning about uh, my predecessor, Nick Mueller, but uh, he is still involved in the museum as the founding president and CEO, and uh, really was the one that had the idea to develop uh, this conference. And for those of you that have been around the museum, you've heard the story about Nick and Dr. Ambrose drinking sherry which led to the development of the D-Day Museum and then all that you see here today. But you may not have heard that it was probably beers with Don Miller that led to the beginning of the International Conference. And uh, so there's a theme here that maybe we all need to think about. But um, Don, Nick, and uh, a few other folks that I'll mention in a moment have uh, had their hand at the wheel of this event going back to the very beginning in 2006. So Nick, thank you for having this great idea and for being a participant all these years. We appreciate it. <laughs> uh, 
and also the conference planning committee, are, many of them are here with us uh, tonight. I'd just like to thank them by name, Alexander Ritchie, Gunter Bischoff, Don Miller, Alan Millett, um, and two that can't be with us, uh, John Morrow uh, and Rich Frank, um, and Con Crane, who by tradition is stuck in an airport somewhere and will arrive <laughs> late. But he will be here tonight and will be with us tomorrow. So my thanks to all of you for your great work putting this program together. Um, as I mentioned uh, earlier, this is our 16th conference, and for 13 of those years, we've had great support from a wonderful partner, the Pritzker Military Foundation and the Pritzker Military Museum and Library. This is the 12th straight year that they have been the presenting sponsor of this program. Um, unfortunately, we don't have any representatives from the library here this weekend, but I want to thank Roberto Bravo, Karima Cruz, Susan Rifkin, and of course, Colonel Jennifer Pritzker, uh, to really show them uh, all that we really appreciate for the work that they've done to help this continue to be the preeminent public history event on World War II. So let's give them a warm round of applause for their support. We, we know that they're tuned in, and we know that they're going to be watching this weekend, and we hope to see them here uh, in person next year. Okay, so now to continue the work that he started at today's uh, symposium and to guide us through the entire weekend as our conference master of ceremonies, it's my pleasure to introduce my colleague, the executive director of the Jenny Craig Institute for the Study of War and Democracy, Dr. Mike Bell. Mike has been with us for just over two years, which in museum time is about 25 years. Um, I'm sure he feels that way. Mike uh, came into the museum and has just done a tremendous job establishing our institute and importantly, uh, leading our team in the final phases of the development of the content and the exhibits for the Liberation Pavilion and much more. Prior to joining our team, Mike had a 33-year career in the U.S. Army, serving in the Gulf War, Bosnia, Kosovo, and the Iraq War. As a Defense Department civilian, he served in the White House as a special assistant to the President for National Security Affairs and the National Security Council Senior Director for Middle East Affairs. Mike is a scholar as well as a soldier, earning his Ph.D. in history at the University of Maryland. And at the National Defense University, Mike was the Dean of Faculty and Academic Programs at the National War College and the Chancellor of the Counterterrorism College. Mike, I think that your time in the Army and State Department and White House probably proved helpful with the tasks you were handed when you got here um, and your diplomatic ways of accomplishing the mission, always focused on accomplishing the mission. So now, ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to introduce my colleague, moderator for tonight. Please join Dr. Mike Bell. Thank you. Well, thank you, Stephen, and uh, thanks to all of you. Uh, you know, I've had a pleasure today uh, to be the, the master of ceremonies, and master is probably overstated, but, you know, the ringleader. But uh, we've had an incredible pre-conference symposium, and I have no doubt the remainder of the conference will, will just continue to build upon that, continue to be engaging and enlightened. Now, tonight is the, Jamin, the, is the General Raymond D. Mason, Jr. Distinguished Lecture on World War II with the topic Rethinking World War II. The Mason Lecture Series is devoted to the legacy of America's largest war. Speakers have included writers, scholars, distinguished members of the armed forces, journalists. The lecture series is through the generosity of the late Major General and Mrs. Raymond Dean Mason, Jr. and the Raymond Dean Mason uh, Foundation. Now, Mason served in the ETO during World War II in the 4th Armed Division, part of General Patton's 3rd Army. Prior to retiring from the military in 1976, he held several high-ranking Pentagon positions. How lucky can you be to serve in the Pentagon, right? <laughs> you can be lucky to be out of the Pentagon. But uh, <laughs> those include uh, Assistant De Deputy Chief of Staff for Operations and Special Assistant to the Deputy Chief of Logistics. See, Pete, we said logistics twice today. The, uh, 
as this is the distinguished Mason, uh, the Mason Distinguished Lecture, we really could not think of two more distinguished historians uh, than to, to kick off this conference than the ones we have on the slate tonight. So I'll start, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce tonight's moderator, someone uh, I imagine everybody in this crowd knows. Uh, you know, he's been part of our public programs and conferences over the years. He's participated in our educational travel programs. He was one of the primary contributors and in fact, um, the animus behind the Arizona State University partnered masters in World War II studies program, our online articles, videos, he's been a major presence. And all that part of Rob Satino's resume was really all after he had an incredible career in academia, just since he's been here. Now Rob uh, received his PhD from the University of Indiana He's taught throughout the country, but I would highlight uh, in particular the, the year he spent as the, the visiting professor at West Point's Department of History. Notice there's a trend here as well. And also his two years at the Army War College, uh, where we, he certainly you know, served to mentor and inspire you know, generations of, of military officers to serve. In 2021, Rob was the recipient of the Samuel Elliott Morrison Prize from the Society of Military History for his lifetime achievement in the field, an incredibly prestigious award. Rob is now the author of 11 books. The 11th that we're gonna hear about uh, more on Saturday morning, uh, which, which Stephen's already, already indicated, but you know, Rob, uh, Rob currently is the museum Samuel Zamuri Stone Senior Historian as well. Now, in the Jenny Craig Institute for the Study of War and Democracy, we, you know, uh, Rob ably led that institution in addition to being the senior historian uh, for three years. Um, incredibly, he survived that. I mean, there's like dog years we put on his life. But, but Rob was also the lead historian for the brand new Liberation Pavilion. Uh, and, and I think uh, you'll have an incredible opportunity to see that uh, at tomorrow's open house or this weekend. Uh, thanks to Rob, you know, for, for really shepherding that through and this creation. And, you know, we found that the initial conversations for this came from the 70th anniversary of D-Day cruise nearly 10 years ago in Rob's conversations with Dr. Mueller. And Rob wasn't even an employee yet of the museum. And so, you know, how these things kind of, uh, evolve over time or the creation stories are quite incredible. I don't know what alcoholic beverage may have been involved. Maybe it was even just water. Um, but, uh, you know, sometimes the, you know, in the informal conversations are these moments of genius. And certainly that, uh, that was one of those. So we're delighted to have uh, Rob lead this opening session uh, with the distinguished Jeremy Black. Uh, who, will, who Rob will introduce uh, on the topic of rethinking World War II. So ladies and gentlemen, uh, at this time, join me in welcoming Jeremy Black and Rob Satino to the stage for this following conversation. Thank you. Ah, <laughs> the bright lights of Hollywood. Well, it's when you're bald, the lights just <laughs> gleam on you. Um, you know, there's a saying that you've all heard, I'm, I'm sure, that uh, someone needs no introduction. And I'm sure you also know what that means, that the person deserves a very, very long <laughs> introduction. And that's my partner up here right now, uh, uh, Jeremy Black. He's asked me to be brief. Um, Introducing Jeremy really hurts my self-esteem, so I, 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 will, be, I will be brief. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's wonderful to have him back at the museum. He, he has been a visitor in the past, and we've had some great conversations. Uh, Jeremy is, is one of the world's foremost and most authoritative military historians, just to put it uh, bluntly. He has over 100 books to his credit. I'm, I have stopped counting at some point. And you know, that needs to sink in, uh, 100 books. Um, Jeremy is the most prolific historical scholar of our age. How's that, Jeremy? Yes, that's short and, short and sweet. Um, so please, yes. Yeah. 
But as you're about, as you're about to, to see and hear, uh, Jeremy is not just a Western military historian. His interests are global. Uh, if, if you wish to be enlightened about almost any topic in military history, as far ranging as Mughal India or, or, or the Taiping Rebellion in China, um, you, I, I, I could recommend that you always uh, turn to Jeremy's work. Uh, Jeremy spent a long and illustrious career at the University of Exeter uh, in the United Kingdom. He's emeritus now. I'm about to retire from the museum, so you are a special breed. To show up in this many numbers to hear two retired historians kind of shoot the bull about World War II. And I think you should give yourself a, a round of applause for that as well. Um, J Jeremy lives in the United Kingdom, as I, I mentioned, uh, but I live here in the United States, and so for you younger people in the audience, keep working hard because you're paying my social security starting January 1st. I want you all to know that. Jeremy, I've, I've, I've said that you're a global historian. If you don't mind, uh, let's, let's start there. Do you think we Westerners have too narrow a view of the war and its global implications? Are, are we missing parts of World War II as you speak to a, a British or an American audience? Well, I used to teach a course on World War II, and I used to start off by saying to the students, Madagascar, Mongolia, Thailand, Iraq, Iran, which of those saw fighting in World War II? Actually, let me ask you lots. And as you may know, I wrote a book on James Bond, two books. So if you get it wrong, I press a button here and you get electrocuted. <laughs> 3,000 volts in the novel Thunderball, though these days, because of health and safety, you would have to be like going to the loo, a restroom in Japan. Anyway, what's the answer to that, please? <laughs> Correct. You see, very good All audience. All of you. <laughs> so, yes, it is a global phenomenon. And to that extent, it wasn't matched by World War I, which was much more geographically limited. Uh, and as a global phenomenon, it's very difficult to provide an account of it. And if I might start off by complimenting the museum, uh, my last World War II talk was at the European equivalent of this, which is the one in Poland at Gdansk, Danzig. And, you know, it's good, um, but I have to say it doesn't in any way cover the world as well as this does, and particularly it is very poor on the war in the Pacific. Mm -hmm. The war in the Pacific, I, I talk to veterans all the time who fought in that theater. My father did, as a matter of mm -hmm. fact, U.S. Army, he was on Guadalcanal. <laughs> and, and I've heard over and over again the war in Europe got far more attention our war, that is, talking to Pacific veterans, I uh, think their theater was relatively underserved at the time by the media and, of course, since then by, by historians. I, is there some justice to that complaint? And if there is, I'd like your thoughts on why that might be so. Well, I think there is some justice to it. I mean, why that should be so is a number of reasons. First of all, between the armistice and the occupation of Japan, the Japanese destroyed much of their war material, you know, the, the archives. Um, so it's quite difficult to write the uh, war in the Pacific from both sides, which is very different from if you're looking at, say, writing a book on the Battle of the Bulge. Uh, secondly, it's actually physically to get onto the ground in some of these areas, not easy. I mean, I've been to Guadalcanal, that's fairly easy to visit, and I notice you have a um, tour there, which is excellent. But some of these places, I went to Rabul once, you know, it's not easy to get to these places, so I think that's another point. But there's also the intellectual uh, issue. World War II intellectually has been dominated by the German war. And whilst the German war was obviously extraordinarily important, uh, Japan was a major power. Japan, in the first six months of its offensive against the United States, Britain uh, and the Dutch, conquered an enormous amount of territory. And the, actual, and the Japanese assumption was a simple one. I mean, I'm, I'm interested in strategy. And usually people do things for a reason. The Japanese assumption was not that they could knock America out of the war. They weren't idiots. They knew that wasn't going to happen. Their assumption was that they could produce a defensive perimeter which would be so difficult to breach and to wage back that in the end the United States would have to accept Japanese domination of the western portion of the Pacific. Now they got America totally wrong, but it required a formidable effort to prove them wrong. If I can bring the subject of colonialism into the subject, into the uh, discussion for a moment. In Europe, clearly, we liberated. 
uh, and the, the crowds were there to greet us as, as we went to one enemy capital after the other, uh, uh, whether it be, be Brussels, whether it be Paris, uh, even, on into, uh, even on into Germany. The Germans today, for example, say it was, it was a war that liberated them. That, is that absent from the, from the Pacific? I, I'm, I'm thinking, for example, of the Dutch East Indies. It was ruled horribly by the Dutch for hundreds of years, and then it was ruled horribly by the Japanese for a very brief time, and then it wound up back in the hands of the Dutch, and the Indonesians had to fight a war of liberation. Yes. But I'm just wondering, if, is, is the colonial issue, do you think that plays into it? Yeah, I think it does. There were nationalist risings, as you know, soon after the war in both Vietnam and Indonesia. And I think that's... And, of course, the Americans avoided that by giving independence to the Philippines, but the new Philippine government faced a sort of communist nationalist insurgency in the late 40s and early 50s. I, if I may, I disagree with you on one point. I wouldn't say the war in Europe was always... Um, liberation. If you were thinking of capitals like Warsaw or Tallinn or Riga uh -huh. or Vilnius, you would not see the arrival of Soviet troops as liberation. Right, yeah. I mean, as you probably know, the standard, the standard remark made about these monuments to Soviet uh, soldiers erected in Eastern Europe was that those were the monuments to the unknown rapist. Yes, right. You know? Right, right. I I also think of San Lo, some GI supposedly said, we sure liberated the hell out of this place, as, as he came through the town. And well, I mean, it's interesting. If you look at it, there is, in the Roosevelt um, Churchill correspondence, there's a very interesting correspondence in early 44 about bombing France. You know, they're interdicting the Normandy battlefield. So the idea is that they take down all the bridges over the Seine, all the bridges over the Loire, which means, because bridges are built at that stage in towns, doing a lot of damage. And a lot of French civilians get killed in that bombing. About 80,000 got killed by Allied bombing. And the, the, both Roosevelt and Churchill are uneasy about this. Now, you don't get Stalin expressing comparable uneasiness about killing non-Germans. Non Stalin once said that you have a man, you have a problem. You get rid of, no man, no problem. You get rid of the man, you've gotten rid of your problem. It's more of a, a utilitarian view. Let me get an issue here of memory and legacy, uh, uh, Jeremy. Do, do you think that if we do have blind spots in our analysis or our memories of, of World War II, might that have an impact when it comes to know, formulation of foreign policy in the present day? I'm thinking of our relations primarily with the People's Republic of China today. Well, it's certainly true that um, we, let's put it like this, the extent to which there was very large-scale fighting in China from 37 onwards is a point that would surprise most younger people and many of, their, many of the older generation. And it was a formative experience for China. But it's equally the case that there were, that the majority of the resistance, <laughs> the majority of the fighting of the Japanese was by the KMT. And that, in a sense, having defeated the KMT by 1949, the communists then created their mythos about the war. So I think one has to be careful here. Part of the problem is that we can end up validating a myth when we're trying to also put, push attention onto China. E uh, not too different from the situation in Eastern Europe. I mean, it needs to be borne in mind that the um, Soviet Union provided an account, and it's now been taken over by President Putin, which forgets the extent to which the Soviet Union was complicit with Germany between 1939 and 1941. And what, in effect, it enables Germany to do is to fight a one-front war. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not saying that the Germans would not necessarily have succeeded in 1940 if they had also been having to keep large forces in Eastern Europe, but I think it would have been much harder for them. And the same thing is true of the war in the Pacific. The task for the Americans and their allies, you know, Australia and Britain, uh, in fighting Japan, and indeed for the Chinese, is made far, far harder by the Soviet-Japanese neutrality pact of the spring of 1941. And in a sense, the Soviets have been given a free pass on this. They don't tend to get much criticism for it.
It's my understanding today that even in, in the People's Republic, there's a greater willingness now to talk about Chiang Kai-shek, the KMT, yes. the, the nationalist government of China at the time. So perhaps the, 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 the Chinese today are looking at a more holistic view, where you can well, just say China rather than the, yeah. strictly the communist. I liberal. mean, you had Rana Mitter this morning, who's very good. I mean, yes. the point is this, that for the communists, the argument of a common Chinese policy is one that can be used both as an attempt to incorporate Taiwan and is one that can also be used it to stir up anti-Japanese sentiment. Um, I think that's all very well, but it needs to be borne in mind that the communists still grotesquely exaggerate the extent to which they were the principal players against, against the Japanese. The, um, Vladimir Putin tells us he's fighting a war in Crimea primarily to tamp down fascism in, in Crimea, as he says. But the, there's a sort of blind spot in the, in the Russian view, is there not, from 1939 to 1941? Yes. Not just a non-aggression pact, but actual, an actual alliance as of September 1930. Oh, yes. I mean, Russia allied very strongly. It, of course, sent troops into Poland. It occupied uh, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania. It extorted territory from Romania. It attacked Finland. I mean, Russia, act, sorry, the Soviet Union acted yes, yes. as a very aggressive power, and it was providing uh, Germany with oil and uh, grain in particular, which really wrecked the major principle of British strategy, which was the blockade, the idea of trying to isolate Germany economically and to produce damage to its economy just wouldn't get, wasn't going to work because Germany had this depth provided by the Soviet Union. You know, if I could recommend one of, one of your books, um, it's, it's your 2019 book called War and Its Causes, and you write in there, I'm, I'm quoting you, World War II was a number of conflicts, differently, closely connected, and partially separate. You, you started off your, your comments tonight by mentioning Mongolia and various other uh, regions of the world, and you wouldn't think that's a direct uh, a fighting theater of World War II, but of course they all were. What are some that we've really forgotten? Uh, if, if you don't mind, I'll ask about Mongolia. Yes, um, Mongolia sees fighting in 38, 39, and then again it sees fighting in 45, when the Soviets uh, fight their way through there as part of their campaign against the Japanese in uh, northern China. Um, things that we've forgotten, like not so much forgotten, but that haven't had there isn't sufficient archival material. So there is a problem with the archival trace for China. There is a problem with the archival trace for Japan, but the biggest archival problem, I would say, is this, that after the fall of the um, Iron Curtain, the Soviets opened a lot of their operational archives. And in fact, an American group based at Fort Leavenworth uh, under David Glantz had already before uh, that had been doing an enormous amount of work on Soviet operational art because they wanted to work out how to fight a sub-nuclear war in northern Germany in the 80s. And they looked in detail, their major analysis historically was of the 1943, 44 and 45 Soviet campaigns. But the one thing the Soviets didn't open was their strategic archives. We know very little about Soviet strategy. We know very little about Soviet intelligence. We know about Sorge, but we know very little. And in particular, what we don't know much about is the Soviet-German peace feelers in 42 and 43. Because, and we know they took place, we know that um, Stalin offered Hitler terms in 43. What we don't know is how far he meant it, um, and we don't know. I mean, it was picked up very quickly by the Brits. One, I, I have to imagine that the Soviets had leaked it. You know, I don't think British espionage was that good. So I think that the Soviets had to have leaked it in order to put the frighteners on the Western allies to yeah. get them to get on with the second front. But what we simply don't know very much at this level of the war, and, you know, no reason for you to buy it. You may have be interested in other aspects, but if you read my strategy book, I'm really quite interested in this level of the war because we make the mistake of assuming that the sides were necessarily fixed after December 41, after, obviously, Pearl Harbor and after Germany declared war on the United States. 
That's fine. They were fixed, but it is entirely possible that they would have been rethought. I mean, in 42 and 43, both Mussolini and the Japanese are pressing Hitler very hard to make peace with the Soviet Union. And there are figures within the Nazi elite, if those two terms don't sound too much incompatible, like uh, Ribbentrop, the foreign minister. No, you can say Nazi elite. I, yeah. I think we're right. Like <laughs> Ribbentrop, the foreign minister, who wants the same. Now, it doesn't happen, and obviously, as we know, Hitler, with his racist and um, essential sense of his view of his historical destiny, it seems unlikely that he would have gone for another peace with the Soviet Union, but of course they'd already been at peace in 39-41, and Stalin's basic attitude was that he wanted the Germans and the Western Allies to fight as much as possible so that they would both be weakened uh, in order to make Russia or well, Soviet Union more dominant thereafter. And that level of of the war, that level of the strategy of the war is still very poorly understood. And uh, the real tragedy is most people don't even get to base one of asking the questions. Yes, yes. yes. And I, bear in mind, in case you think this is all fanciful, 43, of course, Italy drops out of the Axis, 44, uh, Romania and Bulgaria do. People change side under the pressure of things going wrong. What we don't know is at what pace they could have changed sides differently. Yeah. And that means, and of course, also, I mean, you know, the British could have been knocked out in 40. Um, there were peace feelers. The Italians were trying to negotiate a peace between <coughs> Germany and Britain in May 1940, and possibly different British leadership would have gone to that peace, which would have caused, you know, a very different geopolitics of the war. Uh, it caused an amazing problem for the United States. I think of uh, how soon World War II was followed by the next big global conflict, the Cold War. Has the Cold War been a distorting lens for, for us to think about how World War II was actually lived, experienced, and planned at the time? Well, I mean, the Cold... First of all, let me be clear about this. The Cold War continued during World War II. So Soviet espionage continued to be directed in large part against both Britain and the United States. And again, people don't think about that enough. And there was rivalry between the communist resistance and the non-communist resistance in countries like Poland, in Greece, where the two were fighting with British intervention against the communists by the end of 44. So the Cold War continues during World War II. I'm afraid to say President Roosevelt was quite naive about this, but, you know, anybody who was clever knew what was going on. And I, I, after the war, um, in a sense, it was the resumption of usual services, in the sense that in the 20s and 30s, there had been hostility between the Soviet Union and the West. Obviously, from 1945 onwards, the United States is the major power in the West. The principal difference is that Asia is much more important in the late 40s and 50s in the Cold War than Europe. Now, the Europeans don't tend to think that, obviously, um, and the East Coast elite, I would say, in the United States isn't always fully conversant with that. But if you think about it, World War II in East Asia is a stage of what then becomes the Chinese Civil War, the Vietnamese War of the late 40s, early 50s, the Korean War, uh, the Vietnamese War, the, well, the Lao Laotian um, Civil War in the early 60s, the Vietnamese Civil War in the 60s, and so on and so forth. And so that, in a way, um, World War II morphs into post-World War II conflicts in Asia quite seamlessly. Mm -hmm. Is We mentioned earlier about the, the imbalance between the Pacific War and the European War. Is that due to Hitler? You said that, you know, ideologically, historical reasons, there's reasons we look to Europe. 
How important is Hitler to the outbreak of World War II in Europe or generally? Is well, it true that no Hitler, no World War II in Europe? Well, let's just roll back for a second. First of all, if you look at the imbalance between the war in the Pacific and the war in, the, uh, in Europe, there's one reason why the war in Europe is more important and there's one reason where the war in the Pacific is more important other than what we've already said. As far as the war in, in Europe is concerned, the Atlantic is smaller than the Pacific period. And as a result of that, Germany is more of a strategic threat to the United States than Japan is to the United States. Um, and if you look at American defence planning, hemispheric defence planning in 3940, they are much more worried about Japan than Germany. Sorry, J Germany, Germany. Than, than Japan. And they are, I mean, for example, when the Bismarck gets into the Atlantic, I mean, Roosevelt's really bothered about that. He's really bothered that it's going to show up off Norfolk uh, because its guns are so long and there's nothing to match it in the mm -hmm. American Navy. Um, but the, on the other hand, one of the reasons why the Japan War, the war in the Pacific, is really significant is this. We usually, if we're looking at the Germany war, and this is an echo of Cold War priorities, and it might be difficult to say here because we've not got Soviets here, um, but usually during the Cold War, the argument that came from the left and the Soviet Union was that they had borne the major burden of fighting the Germans. Well, they had as far as the Wehrmacht was concerned. From the summer of 41 onwards, over two-thirds of the Wehrmacht was always on the Eastern Front. But the British and the Americans, in that order initially, and then by the end of the war, the Americans and the British, the order gets reversed, bore pretty well all the burden of the long-range air war against Japan because the Soviet Union didn't have a long-range air force. Um, the British and the Americans, and then the Americans and the British, bore the burden of the naval war against Germany because uh, the Soviet Navy was useless in both the Baltic and the Black Sea. The British and the Americans bore the entire burden of war with Italy. And as far as Japan was concerned, the Soviet Union did absolutely nothing until August 45. And even when it did get in in August 45, it was essentially just a land war in Manchuria. So if you're looking at it in about, as it were, which war deserves more attention, partly it is a question of how you look at the respective weight of the Soviet Union versus uh, America and Britain. And for a long time, commentators who were pro-Soviet were therefore inclined to emphasise the German war. As far as when the war starts, well, there are several different trajectories. You could argue that a major war starts when Japan attacks China. You could argue that Germany attacking Poland in 1939 starts another major war. As far as it becoming a world war, it doesn't really become a world war till late 41, partly because Germany in 39, and this tends not to be pointed out, but Germany in 39 is not like Germany in 1914. Germany in 1914 has four colonies in Africa, it has colonies in the southwest and western Pacific, it even has a base in China, all of which require attacking, um, and it's allied Turkey has its empire stretching to the Persian Gulf and the Red Sea. In 39, in contrast, Germany is restricted to a portion of Europe, so it isn't a world war at that stage. And Italy, which does have a more extensive empire reaching to East Africa and North Africa, Italy doesn't come into the war until June 1940. You write in your 2003 book, World War II, A Military History, another recommendation. I'm not sure which of Jeremy's many books we have. We could fill the room. Far too uh, few. With, far too few. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, you might, those of you who are interested, there are good ones in particular on tank warfare and air warfare you might find there interesting. Go. Anyway, go on. Thank you. Thank go you. On. <laughs> you write that World War II was not only a total war, the populations involved were also told it was a total war. This was an intriguing thought to me. How important is government propaganda? And let, let me expand on that question just a bit. <clears throat> we Americans, I, I think it's safe to say, we think of propaganda as something that the other guy does. We just report the war. 
But, but, the, but the, the, the Nazis, the Imperial Japanese, whoever our enemy du jour happens to be are the ones who are engaging in, in propaganda. Does that, that view need correction with regard to World War II? Were the allies, the Americans, the Brits, were, were we actively propagandizing that war? Well, I think, yes, but on, first of all, a democratic society and the United States and Britain were democratic societies. The United States more so because it continued to hold elections during the war, whereas in Britain there was no general election during the war. Um, part of being a democracy is you try and engage your citizenry, and in particular, both Britain and America had introduced conscription to fight the war. In other words, they didn't really have uh, permanent peacetime conscription. If you're going to do that, you owe it to people to explain what they're being asked to fight for. If you want to call it propaganda, yes. I mean, it's worth bearing in mind that there was still a room for adversarial comment, less so than in peacetime, but a characteristic was that it was possible to actually say that the priorities were wrong. It was possible to debate in both Parliament and Congress. I mean, Churchill had to face a motion of no confidence yes, in, in Parliament. Um, so what I would say is that um, if you look at your posters, you've got some marvellous posters here, for example, selling war bonds. Now, when you sell war bonds, you don't explain them to people in terms of the rate of interest they might, and right. might earn. You have a dramatic poster showing them that they're protecting... There's a soldier saying... Yeah, and that they're bonds. protecting the children right. on the home front. Right. I, I would say that was an accurate account. I wouldn't, you know, I mean, you generally people would say that propaganda is defined as an attempt to persuade in which there are deliberate untruths. Mm. I think you would have to say that that was on a pretty low level with both Britain and America. On the whole, they worked on the basis that it was best to try and come across with the truth. Mm. Uh, that was the prince. So, for example, Allied radio did not make a habit of reporting the sinking of German or Japanese warships that hadn't sunk, whereas German radio famously reported the Ark Royal as sunk many, many times. Twelve times. <laughs> yeah. So I think there is a slight difference of priorities there. Um, you have a book uh, that came out recently, uh, 2020, A History of the Second World War in 100 Maps. You see, I go belly up when I hear that title, and I'm going to buy that book, and I bet many of you are too. You point out these maps, these beautiful full-color maps in the Los Angeles, uh, Los Angeles Times uh, of the China-Burma-India theater or, or, the, or allied strategic thrusts against Japan and the Pacific. How important is something like that, just printing a map for the popular audience? Well, the... I mean, as I, what I tried to show is that there are different types of maps, you know, geopolitical, tactical, operational, strategic, um, and ones that are reaching out to the wider public. What is striking is the quality in particular of American newspaper and news magazine, Time and Fortune and Life, all have marvellous maps. The Americans in particular engage better than anybody else, as I try to show, with the challenge of air warfare. Mm. Because what air warfare does is it gives you a problem, how to explain it in map terms, but it also gives you the ability to provide what, you, what I would call a panoptic view. In other words, a view from up top, a long way up top, and to then try and look at what the world would look like from that perspective. Um, now, there are good political reasons for this. Roosevelt, as you may know, urged people to look at maps of the war. He urged people to look at maps prior to his weekly radio broadcasts, and he famously was frequently photographed with maps in, in the White House, in the Oval Office. Churchill had a big um, uh, map library as well. Uh, Roosevelt's point uh, was that if you look at aerial perspective maps, both East Asia, Japan, and Europe look much closer to the United States than if you flatten out the world. Yes, right. So that, in other words, he was arguing um, that isolationism wouldn't work as a military policy. In, in, you know, whatever happened politically, once you're at war, it's not going to work because you're going to be within aerial uh, range eventually. Mm -hmm. 
And, you know, if you look at um, the, uh, the background of his, plan, of his ideas, not too stupid. I mean, the Germans, they were preempted by the Brits, but the Germans wanted to take over Iceland, which, of course, was a Danish dependency. The, naval, the German naval staff had plans to create bases in the Azores, the Cape Verde Isles, the Canaries, all for forward projection against the Western Hemisphere. Um, so the, the notion that Roosevelt is coming out with is one which relies on public education, and I think it could fairly be said that that isn't some form of propaganda. He's, there, is no ac I mean, there is no accurate way to map the world. You probably know this. Um, uh, the world is a three-dimensional sphere, slightly squashed, actually, at each pole. But essentially, if you think of the, ro the world as a three-dimensional, sphere, any way that you try and map a three-dimensional sphere in two dimensionals involves some distortion. What he is trying to get people to realise is that in the age of air power, both Europe and uh, East Asia are closer than they look if you have the conventional 1930s maps. Mm -hmm. That's a brilliant book, Jeremy. I, I recommend oh. it highly. Again, uh, A History of the Second World War in 100 Maps. You, if you expect, expect to see ta tactical and operational maps, they're there aplenty, but yeah. There's, yeah. there's also these other areas that Jeremy goes into. I just thought it was brilliant. Um, we've just opened up a new pavilion here in the museum. Le Liberation Pavilion, it's called. Um, World War II shattered the old order. Everyone in the room knows this, both in Europe and the Pacific. And we, we here at the museum, quite frankly, sing the praises of the post-1945 generation of statesmen who rebuilt this, this shattered world. Um, do you agree with that point of view? Um, what did they get right, and did they get anything wrong in this post-World War II settlement? Well, I don't think it was necessarily easy to get things right if you're dealing with Stalin, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so, I mean, let's be clear about this. You're absolutely right, the world was shattered. In 1945, most of the world was in ruins, bankrupt, the, a lot of the cities of the world devastated, etc., etc., etc. So, this is an enormous problem for the United States to work out what it wants to do to be safe, not least because once existing naivety about a peace dividend is put to one side, they become growingly worried about the Soviet Union. And once the Soviet Union has the atom bomb, then they know they're in trouble. And, of course, the gap between the A-bomb and the H-bomb is comparatively narrow. Sorry, the, between sorry, the Americans and then the Soviets getting it. The gap with the H-bomb is even narrower. Yes. And by 1955, you know, there is real anxiety about the Soviets being able to drop atom bombs on, on Amer and H-bombs on American cities. So for the Americans, I think, it's not that they got things wrong. I think that's foolish. I mean, you know, sometimes people, academics, blame the Americans for the Cold War. Well, as I said, the Cold War simply resumed. And Stalin, I mean, Khrushchev's joke about Stalin was that Stalin's idea of foreign policy was to keep the anti-aircraft uh, batteries around Moscow in 24-hour alert for immediate attack. You know, that, right. you know, Stalin doesn't really have an idea of peaceful coexistence. <laughs> so I think in strategic terms, it's very difficult. And we heard a paper, I was listening to it this morning, by um, a, a very good paper on the Marshall Plan, and the Marshall Plan is for, I mean, you know, it's forward defence for the United States. I mean, essentially, the United States switches to a system of forward defence before they fully appreciate their vulnerability with, you know, with atomic weaponry. Once they appreciate that vulnerability, then they have, in a sense, a more difficult debate because there's this debate, many of you will recall it, from the 50s about rollback or non-rollback. Um, and personally, once the other side had uh, thermonuclear weapons, I don't think you could have had rollback. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, the world is stuck in a stasis uh, strategically from the 50s uh, to the end of the European Cold War. Uh, the American great triumph, and, you know, he's recently died, Kissinger, 
of course, but the American great triumph is to exploit the Sino-Soviet split, looked at differently, not that Kissinger would say this, but looked at differently, the Chinese exploited the Americans to help them against the Soviets. Right. Yeah. So it works both ways. You, things usually do work both ways. Um, so no, I think that people made a relatively good fist in a difficult world. Mm -hmm. I uh, think a lot about our museum's uh, mission statement. A shout out to Nick Mueller right there in the front row. It's a three-part mission statement. We like to talk about the American experience, uh, why the war was fought, how it was won, and the third part, what it means today. Mm. Let me pin you down on this, Jeremy. It's a big question. How much does our present-day world arise out of World War II? Our political structure, power relationships, our, our conflicts. Our, how important, is, to put it bluntly, is World War II today? Right, well, first of all, let's take it outside the usual way we would look at it. It is very important in emotional and collective psychology terms. Uh. Many of the national... There's nothing wrong with national myths. Men they give people a sense of identity and cohesion. Many of the national myths of the present day derive from World War II. You referred earlier to the Chinese one, I refer, um, we referred to the Russian one. You could say the same about the Brits, you know, um, and you could their say... Their finest hour. Their finest hour, and you could say the same about the Americans, yeah. the greatest generation. Yes. So, I think, you know, these are both truths and also important to identity. So that, I think, is very significant. Clearly, it varies depending upon which part of the world you're in. You asked a very good question earlier on about colonial decolonization in Asia. The identity of countries like Indonesia or Myanmar or India is not set by World War II. It is set by the experience of getting rid of colonial rule. And indeed, now that India has passed China as the most populous country in the world, um, you know, I think the, as it were, and the Indians have a slightly ambiguous attitude to World War II. Many of them fought in World War II, but they fought as part of the British Empire, and that's not something that many of them are necessarily comfortable about, yes, yes. Uh, even though it was a volunteer army, the largest volunteer army in history, actually. Um, clearly, as far as the modern world is concerned, some things have got absolutely nothing to do with World War II. When I was young, when I was born, the world's population was 2.7 billion. It's now 8 billion. That's got absolutely nothing to do with World War II. I think I know what that has to do with it. Yeah, well, you know, <laughs> um, the... And, you know, so there are some aspects that are not determined by it. But as far as international politics are concerned, I think it is very important, and in a way, the world is in the shadow of it. Now, you referred to the mission statement of the museum. The mission statement of any museum in this context, as with any conference like that, is inherently complex. Because we do, we both honour, as we did with the two gentlemen that fought and risked their lives in the war, you honour those, and may I say, as I think the only Brit here, I'm well aware that my country's freedom owes a lot to the efforts made many Americans made. So, you know, there are a lot of people in the world who are sensible know that sort of thing. So there's the sense of, you know, uh, of a kind of... Um, uh, sort of more than an affectionate loyalty to the past, a sort of urgent feeling to the past, towards the past. Also, there is this question of how best to do it. Now, I think you've got it right here. Um, I think that always you will have people that will complain. That's the nature of things. And always there will be debates about things. That, again, is the nature of things. But if you consider many of the you know, the discussion of war, World War II over the last 30 years, so the role of women, You've got a good representation here mm -hmm. of the home front, for example. You've got a greater sensitivity to the role of African Americans than would have been the case if a museum of this type had opened in 1960. Yes. You know, there is more of a sensitivity to the plight of civilians. I think, actually, you have moved with the times whilst at the same time acknowledging what happened in the past, and I think you've got that right. On that note, <laughs> it's a mic drop. We, we, oh, okay. <laughs> Jeremy, we've, we've run slightly over our, our time, and we do want to uh, throw you to the tender yes. mercies of our, of our audience. 
Um, you've written, but let me ask one more question, if, if no one minds. You wrote a book uh, called Counterfactual, what if? It's called Counterfactualism and the Problem of History. It's 2008. Uh, again, if you don't mind, let me, let me pin you down. Is there, is there, Jeremy Black have a favorite counterfactual of World War II? What if something had gone differently and how it, all, how it might have transformed the nature yeah. of the war? Yeah, I think counterfactuals are very important. I've actually done two books on counterfactual. The, late, the latest one, Alternative Histories, is published by Indiana, and it's a good book. Um, the, <laughs> you can, if you're an author, you can say, you know, you're, you know, I'm a pro. I'm a pro. I know which ones of mine are better than the others, all right? Um, so, counterfactualism. There's three types of counterfactualism, and this is worth thinking about because we all in our conversations have counterfactualism. Number one, there are the counterfactuals which were thought about at the time. Yes. Number two, there were the things that could have happened which people at the time didn't really envisage. Maybe with good reason, I mean, because they were highly implausible. Let's say um, you know, the most obvious implausible one, but actually possible, is a meteorite landing in the Western approaches on the night of the 5th to the 6th of June 1944 and go producing a tsunami now down the channel. Now, in a way, in a way that's obviously ridiculous, but what it captures is a big is both the real thing they did think about, which is bad weather, and the other thing is what would have happened if the German resistance, partly because of the different locations of the Panzer divisions, would have been better. Yeah. So that's a re And then part three, which is just ridiculous, is things that couldn't have ever happened. So they're a waste of time. Now... Alien and... A alien well, whatever. Yeah. You know, I don't, don't trouble your, your <laughs> nightmares, you know. Uh, you know. Now... <laughs> Usually, when people look at counterfactuals, they look at specific events. You know, what would have happened if Hitler had been blown up in the July bomb plots? That's a classic example of a specific event. And those can be valuable. They're relatively easy to discuss. But actually, some of the more interesting counterfactuals are ones that ask you broader questions. So. One of the ones I was asking earlier, what would have happened if the German-Soviet uh, peace feelers in 43 had had more success? Mm -hmm. That is a reasonable one. Or, and this is something that happens in all alliances, both alliances between states and alliances within states, because, as you're aware, an, as a state, the United States, Britain, is an alliance, it's a coalition, and its military effort is a coalition. And that is the question of priorities. What would have happened if the priorities had been different? Now, some of those priorities, some of the debates, like Admiral King wanting more of the resources for the Navy and for the Pacific, those are well known. Some of them are less well known, particularly, as I said, with the Soviets. So if you ask me a favourite, because I'm interested in strategy, I would put, my, put it in the strategy ones, I would ask the question, what would have happened for the Western Allies if there had been been an end to the war between the Soviet Union and Germany. Now, that war could have done different ways. In the end of um, August uh, 1941, Stalin had a mental breakdown. He thought he was going to be replaced. This was after the fall of Minsk. Um, and there was a sort of wobbling of that regime. We don't know what would have happened. In the end, it didn't happen. Same thing on October the 16th, 17th. 1941, there's a no, another Soviet wobble. I mean, they're, they're quite fortunate with their wobbles because they can control the streets with the NKVD. Mm -hmm. the, and Stalin believed, you know, the, uh, that the Politburo was going to remove him earlier on. Yeah. So there are Soviet wobbles, and the, the interesting question is, would a new Soviet regime have done a deal with the Germans? Yeah. Would Stalin, under other circumstances, have done a deal with the Germans? And what would this have meant for the British and the Americans. Because the key point to bear in mind here is when Hitler invaded the Soviet Union, part of that was his determination for race war. He wanted to subjugate Slavs and kill Jews. Uh, that was part, you know, he wanted you, uh, Europe to be Judenfrei, free of Jews. That was part of it. But part of it was a simple one. 
He wanted to get to London via Moscow. He reckoned that if he could knock the Soviet Union out of the war... And remember, at this stage, everybody assumed the Americans would do nothing. America had done nothing um, in 38, nothing in 39, nothing in 40. Everybody believed the, you know, the great appeaser, the United States. You won't like me saying that, but it's true. Um, so it, the assumption was that if the Soviet forces uh, were defeated and Hitler would take... Moscow, then the British would see that they had to come to terms. Uh, again, would that have happened? We don't know. We simply don't know. There are no British position papers saying this is what we're going to do. If you look at the British strategy papers for late 41, they are, though, full of naivety, which they knew. I mean, you, they assume, they're, they're they assume that they can in some way defeat Germany by a mixture of blockade, aerial attack, um, strategic bombers, and um, supporting sabotage and resistance ac across Europe. It wasn't going to work. Those were simply not going to do it. You had to defeat the main German battle armies. And the British simply didn't have the capacity to do that um, in the second half of 41. So it's a very interesting question as to what they would have done at that point. The great wobbles of World War II, Jeremy. I think we have yeah. another book on our hands here. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Jeremy Black, the easiest interview in the world. <laughs> I think through my light damaged eyes, I see Jeremy Collins strolling up the central aisle. I Ladies and gentlemen, if you uh, please raise your hand, Connie and myself will bring the microphone to you. We'll start towards the back in the center, gentlemen. Thank you, Jeremy. Uh, Admiral Halsey of the U.S. Navy, command in the South Pacific, had a big sign in his headquarters saying, kill Japs, kill Japs, kill more Japs. It's hard for me to imagine any American or British senior officer in Europe, other than maybe Bomber Harris, having a sign saying, kill Germans, kill Germans, kill more Germans. To what extent do you think racism affected the way the war was fought, thought about at the time, and thought about since then? Thank you. Thank you. Well, that's a very good question. Uh, sure. Let me say, if you were a Soviet general, you would not have been so sensitive to the... Uh, <laughs> and, in fact, the usual, the usual Soviet practice was to shoot... Uh, Germans in black uniforms out of hand because it was assumed they were SS, which was a real problem if you were in a panzer unit yes. because they usually wore black as well. Um, so I'm not so sure about this. In one of my books, I talk about a debate between um, uh, American and British um, uh, Air Force generals, as it were, the Americans call them generals, we don't, about shooting down um, the pilots who have bailed out of German planes operating between Tunisia and Sicily in 43. And they have a discussion about it, and it's quite interesting. You know, you won't be surprised. Some think it's a bad idea, some think it's a good idea. You don't want these people to survive, they might come up again. And so, and, but obviously, as a target, somebody in a parachute is quite easy to machine gun. Um, I, what I would say is that, that, yes, there was a component of hostility to the Japanese that you might call racism. But on the other hand, there were practical difficulties of fighting people who went in for dummy surrenders and who fought to the death. I mean, it's, you know, it's not easy if people fight in a different parameter. As far as the Germans were concerned, if you look at the Normandy campaign, Attitudes hardened a bit when they came across evidence of the Germans shooting prisoners. Now, the major group of prisoners the Germans shot in the Normandy campaign were Canadians. I think it's fair to say this didn't improve the Canadian attitudes towards Germans. So, you know, one's got to be cautious here. Um, the... Um, I, I think that there has been a reading from 
um, some of the statements made to assume that that was policy. I think that it's more ambivalent than that. That's what I would say. And the same, actually, incidentally, for the Soviets. Yes, it's true that the Soviets killed a lot of Germans, but actually, most German prisoners were taken off by the Soviets to be worked to death in the gulags, and a surprising number of them were able to get back in 53 to 55 when the camps were opened after, after Stalin died. Uh, the survival rates, though, varied. Officers, German officers, survived better than German troops in Siberia and obviously your chance of surviving went up enormously if you were willing to go and volunteer for the East German army. Even on the on the Eastern Front we hear all the time being taken prisoner by the Germans was a death sentence. It, it all depended when you were taken prisoner yeah. by the Germans. There were times the Germans wanted labor, there were times there was more of an ideological purpose early in the campaign, later, so it, it's, a, it's a fraught question. It's a fraught question, yes. Next question's all the way in the back to your left, please. I, I suspect a lot of people here will be thinking the same question that uh, I'd like to ask, and that is from the concept of appeasement to the lessons learned in Europe in World War II, relating that now to what's happening in Ukraine. What lessons now should all of Europe remember in relation to how they handled Putin in Ukraine based on what happened 75, 80 years ago. We asked the hardcore questions here, Jeremy. I'm, I'm <laughs> glad you're answering it. Yes. Um, <laughs> well, the thing is this. Um, first of all, we are presently um, supplying, I mean, obviously there are issues at the moment, but we are presently supplying the Ukrainian war effort. So I don't think people would currently say that there is appeasement of Russia. Um, <clears throat> the question is, is there a way out of this conflict that is going to be beneficial to the Ukrainians? Because clearly, the, you don't want to be still fighting this in five, ten years' time. And there isn't a way in which, um, you know, you're going to be able to conquer Russia. And there is no current sign that Putin is going to be overthrown. So the question is, how can it be done? Is there a trade-off? Is the trade-off that you accept the current uh, Russian gains in return for uh, Ukraine joining NATO and the EU. I don't know. I'm not a diplomat. Um, what I can tell you is the year before... La no, it was last year. Last year, I was invited to give the opening address at the Baltic Defence College, which is in Tartu. So that's the joint college of Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania. It's about 80 miles from the Russian border. Well, the first thing that was very striking was the way that half the audience was in fatigues uh, because they are very much of the mind that they're going to be next. And the point about that, which is a matter to us, is not just the humanitarian and all the rest of it. I mean, I'm a strategist. Humanitarian things, I'm afraid, don't generally play much in our ballpark. But the simple one is this. We are guarantors under NATO of those powers in a way that we aren't guarantor of Ukraine. Our help to Ukraine is discretionary. Um, and, you know, I made that point about appeasement. You know, those were all discretionary choices. We can debate whether they made the right or the wrong choices. And, you know, I've written about those at length. But they certainly weren't breaking their treaty obligations or international law. If we decide to do nothing if these countries are attacked, then we're in a different position. And you might say sometimes you have to break your international agreements. You know, that's a perfectly defensible proposition if you think it's necessary. But it does mean that you're going to find it far harder to get um, alliance structures to work. Um, and I'm not quite sure what happens. Now, the way I envisage it is not um, um, tanks coming across the frontier, as happened in the case of Ukraine, but it's more there is a significant a minority population of Russians in each of those three Baltic states, those being stirred up, subversion, 
uh, Russians coming in small numbers across the frontier, uh, special units, the same sort of thing that happened in Crimea. Right. And there the question is, at what point is the trigger that one decides to act or not to act? And that's a very tricky one at the present moment. And it's worth bearing in mind that if you're looking at the crisis last year, last year two things happened. Obviously the Russians failed to conquer Ukraine, hurrah. But it's worth bearing in mind that our entire deterrent structure failed. We knew the Russians were coming. Both American and British intelligence were publishing real-time information, including aerial photography, <coughs> of Russian columns preparing to attack. There were significant attempts made in missions to Moscow. All sorts of people, the American Secretary of Defence, British Foreign Secretary, French President, all sorts of people went and urged Putin not to do anything and deterrence in the sense of trying to persuade him not to do anything failed. The question then mean, then works, well, what are we next going to do if we want deterrence to work in another context? And that is where we are at the present moment. And, you know, obviously it also relates to the Taiwan issue. Yes. Or anything else for that matter. I mean, after all, what is, what is there to stop North Korea firing of, you know, it's been firing um, um, uh, its long-range ballistic missiles. What is to stop them firing one which acts Accidentally hits, i.e., in inverted commas, hits Guam. What are you going to do? Start World War III? I don't know. But you need to think about it, what you are going to do in those contexts, because it's, it, you take the view always that this is somehow a problem for other powers, and, you know, the bloody Europeans, why don't they get their act together and spend more money? Which I can understand. I fully understand. I would, if I was in you, I'd take the same position. But the point is that deterrence is also a question for you vis-a-vis uh, -vis both North Korea and China. All things old are new again. B back when I was coming up in the 80s, there was this notion of what the, the Hamburg grab. The Soviet armies come across the West German border and just seize Hamburg. Mm. Would, would an American president start World War III over that? And if he didn't, what would be left of the NATO alliance? And I guess we're kind of right back to that kind of reasoning right now. Well, I think one of the interesting things, we, you know, uh, as far as the 1980s are concerned, if the Soviets had attacked through the Fulda Gap, which was widely assumed against Ramstein, there were American units there, just as there are American units in South Korea. If North Korea attacks South Korea, there's, what, about 38,000 American troops there? I cannot believe that an American president would just write off 38,000 troops. Mm -hmm. I think that they would feel that they needed to act. And I think there's no doubt that if the Soviets had attacked American forces in West Germany, Germany in the 80s, an American president would have, would have been President Reagan in the early 80s, I'm sure he would have... Uh, uh, would yeah. have been safe there, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Next question is in the back to your right, gentlemen. Thank you. Um, I'd like to address the question of racism about the Japanese, the way they looked at the, uh, the Chinese, the Koreans as subhuman. I think that needs to be brought out. It wasn't just us uh, that we're automatically racist. They're the ones that started it. Number two, what about why did Hitler invade Russia? <laughs> he had a million, I was, he, I was told that the Russians had a million troops on the Polish border, something like that. But could you explain that one, please? OK. Well, first, as far as the first comment is concerned, you're absolutely right. The Japanese had very pejorative... I mean, they were rulers of Korea already, but they had very pejorative views of Chinese. I would say the interesting thing is, if you're looking at the Japanese and the Germans, um, they were both political systems, the ideologies of the governing groups, that believed in the triumph of the will and believed that they were superior, not just in racial terms, but also as a, as a society. So, for example, if you're Hitler and 
your, you know, the senior echelons around him. You believe that the Soviets are bound to fail because they've been uh, weakened by communism and they're all Slavs and they're run by Jews, which would have supplied, surprised uh, Stalin. You believe the British are bound to fail because they're decadent and, you know, in decline and run by Jews, which would have surprised Churchill. Um, and you believe that the Americans are bound to fail because they're hedonistic, um, they're Democrats, and Hitler's great belief is that America was weakened by deracination, uh, and also they're run by Jews. So uh, the Japanese had, not the Japanese weren't bothered by anti-Semitism, the Japanese had similar views about the weakness of consumerist and democratic societies. So it's not just racism, there's a set of value judgments that encourage um, a, as it were, evaluation. And interestingly enough, you see the same thing in modern society. Um, you, you, we were asked about Mr. Putin. Mr. Putin, for example, uh, tells Russians that their society is under threat from the West culturally and makes much about, you know, attitudes towards, you know, transsexualism and so on, and, you know, argues that this reflects a cultural failure and threat from the West. Now, on the second argument, of course, Goebbels famously alleged that the Soviets were about to attack um, the uh, Germany. There's no evidence for that. Um, uh, there are certainly Soviet war plans, but just as under the colour-coded American war plans of the 1930s, there are American war plans to, for example, invade Canada. I mean, that's one of the things. That's one of the things armies do. Um, the Hitler didn't need to attack the Soviet Union in 41. He was worried that in the long term, things seemed to be, in his eyes, moving against Germany. He's worried about the direction of American policy. He's worried about the strength of the fact that Britain has, won't get out of the war but continues uh, to fight and is putting a lot of pressure on the Italians. Um, he's not sure what the Soviets might do in the long term. But there is no need for him to attack. He does, though, have have this very strong um, belief in his destiny and the dis destiny of German, Germany and the Germans um, to control uh, Europe. And he does believe now that the only two challenges to that are the British, who he seems to feel he can't do much about since he hasn't invaded them, um, and the Soviets. And this represents an opportunity to smash the Soviets and to kill Jews. There are also particular disputes between Germany and the Soviet Union in late 40, early 41, over spheres of influence in the Balkans. But quite frankly, those weren't enough of a reason to go to war and take the risk that he did. Because the thing about um, the fighting on the Eastern Front um, is that Hitler hadn't worked through the problems of actually fighting the Soviet Union, the scale of the Soviet Union. And also, I mean, it's a classic example. The, um, the Germans were pretty good tactically, not bad operationally, though they did get some of their operations wrong, and absolutely abysmal strategically. And one of the interesting things is there was, after the war, and maybe some of you um, uh, are affected by this, this tendency to big up the Germans. Most scholarly study in the last 20 years has been fairly disparaging about the Wehrmacht, and in in particular about German strategy. When you want to fight a war, I'll make a general point and then we'll take it to Germany. When you want to fight a war, you're trying to do two things. You're trying for output and outcome. Output is conquering territory, defeating your opponents. It involves tactical and operational considerations. Outcome is coercing your opponents to accept your will and stop fighting. Because ultimately, that's how you win a war, um, as we learnt when we get it wrong. 
Now, the Germans had absolutely no understanding of that as far as the Soviet Union was concerned in 1941-42. And that was a real weakness, and it contrasts with the situation that they offered the French in 40, for example, and actually offered the Brits in 40. The French said yes, the Brits said no, but in each case, the Germans had thought through a more sensible outcome. So the result of the deal with Vichy is that they didn't actually have, the Germans didn't have to occupy French North Africa. They, t the, they didn't have to worry about the French fleet sailing away and so on and so forth. There was absolutely nothing on the table for the Soviets. And I think that this was a real failure of German strategy. Uh, Hitler famous quote is, we'll just have to kick, the, kick in the door and the whole rotten structure will come tumbling down. Now, how that actually was to happen in reality was never really thought out properly. I have to say, Jeremy, not thinking th about imposing your will on your adversary, and the Germans are unaware of how to, really unaware of that aspect, and yet it's a Prussian philosopher of war, Karl von Clausewitz, who formulated that? Yeah, but you see, Hitler, you've got to remember, is the classic problem of taking somebody who's relatively low grade. Yeah. You know, I mean, I mean, it's interesting. <laughs> he was a, a lazy man. He was not particularly clever, but he was a great, you know, great in rhetoric, and he knew how to to stir up about a third to a half of the population. Once he seized power, he then knew how to destabilize the institutions and to use terror. Yeah. And, you know, he did it from that respect quite brilliantly. Um, I mean, he was hell... I mean, if any situation was rotten, it was Germany that, it in that enabled somebody like that to take over. He's not Napoleon. No, um, well, that note, Jeremy, where are you? Are, are, is, uh, do we have time for one more? I'm lurking in the corner. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Rob oh, Satino and Dr. Jeremy Black. All right. <laughs> Was that OK? Yeah, the easiest interview in the world. Oh, well, really. <laughs> so uh, thank you, Rob, and especially to Jeremy for starting us off so masterfully. And thanks to the audience for your thoughtful and excellent questions. and. You know, in, in, in the interest of that, we're, we'll move forward and stay on schedule. But, you know, Jeremy and Rob, I think you've set an incredibly high bar for the next uh, two Thanks. days. Uh, thank you for that. Um, you know, a couple of brief housekeeping house, uh, remarks, though, before some of you go to the bar, a uh, different bar. Um, Rob and Jeremy will both be outside in the Arcadia Terrace for book signing. Oh. Uh, probably not 100 books, but uh, quite a few. <laughs> Uh, for tomorrow morning, we have breakfast in the terrace uh, from 6.30 to 08.30. The first session, though, is at uh, 08.30 tomorrow, the first session of the day. I'd request please take your stuff with you tonight uh, so that you, you're not sad tomorrow and you find it's not here. Thanks again to the Pritzker Military Foundation on behalf of the Pritzker Military Museum and Library. Thank you very much. Thanks to you all. and. Please give me, uh, let's give one more round of applause to Dr. Jeremy Black and Rob Cicchino. Have a good evening.